All right, so it's a bit frustrating that my voice isn't 100% because, you know, and it's, uh, you know, it's like sitting there, it's so, it's so weird, like sitting in church and like not singing, you know, it, it, and, and I'm a very talkative person. So that's why I was telling Michael, I, I wanted to go soul winning this afternoon and be a silent partner, but I know that if I'm a silent partner, we just end up talking a lot. <laughs> anyway, so it's like, it's, you, you don't, yeah, yeah, you just end up talking. So it's like, it's hard for me to like stop myself from talking. So <clears throat> it's the same in church, um, but it's good because then I can, I can hear you guys singing and I think it's, it's really, you know, you can sort of reflect on how, how God, you know, is listening to us singing and praising him and I'm sure he, he gets a lot of pleasure from that. And, you know, I want to definitely encourage you guys, you know, when you sing, like, don't, you know, don't, don't hold back, you know, like I feel like I, I'm hearing everyone sing and it, it's like, I know you can sing louder because, because you can talk louder than you sing. Right? You could t- like people say, like, I can't sing loud, but you hear them shouting. And of course you can sing louder than that. It's just you're not singing louder because of pride or, you, you know, you're, you're worried about how you sound. But, you know, when you sing, you know, you know I know, you know, a lot of people are worried about, oh, you know, if I sing really loud and people are going to criticize my singing. But, you know, whenever you do anything that's noticeable, you're always going to have critics, right? But, you know, we should be thinking about how we're going to please God. You know, we want, we want to make a joyful noise to the Lord. And also the singing is meant to edify one another. People should be able to hear you sing. So that's why when I sing, I, I want to be heard by the church because that's the whole point, right? The point is that we speak to one another in psalms and hymns and, and spiritual songs. <clears throat> so I encourage you to sing louder, you know, and when, you know, when you sing louder, you realize, you know, everyone's, no, no, nobody's... <coughs> the interesting thing is there doesn't really need to be that many people singing loud to fill the room with, with noise to the point where you can't really distinguish between different people. I mean, you, if you've ever been in a room where there's maybe five or six men that are singing really loud, I mean, that, that pretty much fills the room and then everyone's voices are hid in that sort of singing anyway. So, <clears throat> all right, uh, I'm not talking about singing. Uh, I'm talking about this. So, 1 Corinthians 9. So, <clears throat> last week... <coughs> Last week I talked about the law of tithing and sometimes when you preach on tithing and my position is, you know, tithing is, a, is, a, is just for the Levitical priesthood. That's why it's not something um, that we do for today. But, but really, you know, I, I sometimes tell people when they ask me my position on tithing, I, I sort of tell them, you know, it, it's really like a, it's, it's, it's a doctrinal difference. It doesn't really have a practical difference in the sense that, you know, even if you don't believe in tithing, you, you're, you're still going to practice giving the same way as somebody that would tithe, right? It's just a different mindset. It's not, you know, it's not that you have to calculate a specific amount. And it's not that if you don't give, you know, you're cursed of God. The difference is, you know, in the New Testament, the more you give, the, the more you're going to reap from in that investment. You know, whether it's more work is going to get done or you're going to lay up more treasures in heaven. Um, but it's, it's still the same practice in the sense that, you know, you're going to be giving regularly to the local church or you're going to be giving regularly to the work of God, whether it's, it, it's just, there's, there's no emphasis on the amount anymore. You know, when people believe in tithing, it's like it must be 10% to the local church. And we, we talked about all these ways that you calculate it. And, and people get really into the nitty gritty of like, you know, somebody gives them a gift and then they have to figure out how much that gift was worth because they have to tie 10% of that gift. And, it, you know, it, it's... I don't think that's the attitude and the mentality that God wants in the New Testament. You know, we don't see that throughout. It's more, and that's what we're going to talk about. So, like I said, it, to me, it's, it's not really a difference in practice. And, and that's the problem because sometimes people, they're against tithing because they don't want people to give to the local church. It's like they almost have a vendetta. And, you know, I understand because people maybe have been burnt by people that have abused the money, have abused the authority, or, you know, they're using the money for things that shouldn't be spent on. You know, they're using it unwisely. So people have the right maybe motive where they want the money to be spent wisely, but then they go on this vendetta to say, well, there's no tithing. So don't, you know, don't give to this organization. You know, don't, you know, uh, bishops and deacons shouldn't get paid a salary. They should be working as well. And, and, and that's not what we see in the New Testament. So let's start at 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9, we'll just go through here. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting that's happening in 1 Corinthians or in, in the Corinthian church is that Paul is being accused of not being a legitimate apostle. You know, there's this controversy going on. And that's where you can see him alluding to this where you know he's comparing himself to false apostles that are coming in and taking advantage of the first uh, of the corinthians 
<coughs> and, and, and this is why we see this, this, uh, this here in 1 Corinthians 9, where there are certain... <coughs> there is certain authority that comes with being a leader in the local New Testament church. Um, but Paul, we see here that he specifically, with the Corinthians only, denied himself and abased himself of this authority and of this power that he had um, in certain areas um, to distinguish himself from these false apostles that were, that were creeping in. Uh, and we'll see that as we go through these passages. So he says here, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? <clears throat> so he's saying, you know, he, he is an apostle, right? He's sort of saying the negative. He is free. He's seen Jesus Christ. Um, the, first, the Corinthian church is his work in the Lord. He says, if I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. So he's saying, even if other people don't think I'm an apostle, you, you know I'm an apostle because you are the proof that, that I am an apostle, you know, because there were things done in the, in the Corinthian church and they saw his work, they were with him. He says, mine answer to them that do examine me is this, you know, have we not power to eat and to drink? So you think power and authority, right? That's how the King James Bible also translates that same word. <coughs> So he says, have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about sister or wife as well as other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord and, and Cephas? So it's not that, um, so he's saying here that he, he's able to, right? If he wanted to get married, he could, right? But then it's, it's not that, it's not that he, he's saying that people shouldn't get married at all, right? He's just saying he, he didn't in this case. Uh, but what we see here, it says, as well as other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas, What's interesting there is that we know that, that the Apostle Peter was married. You know, he had a mother-in-law. We see here that you know, even Paul alludes to him being married. Uh, but yet the Catholic Church teaches that, you know, bishops and popes shouldn't be married. They should be celibate. Whereas their first bishop or their first pope that they believe um, was actually married. Um, or I only and Barnabas, Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? So you see here they can... They can forbear working in, and not have to work a, a, a sort of a job to, to make money because they're able to take wages from the church. <clears throat> who goeth a warfare at any time? Or who, who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? So what is he saying there? He says, what soldier goes to war? Well, what soldier do you expect to go to war? And while he's on the battlefield, he should be like trying to make, do it, like get a job as well and make money to like pay for his food, pay for his uniform. He's just saying like, that. It's just, it's not how it works, right? He says he'd go with the warfare at any time at his own charges. So even with soldiers, you know, and, and those of us who are in the ministry, we are like the full-time soldiers of this war that's happening, right? You know, part-time soldiers, you have people that support the troops, have all different sorts of um, roles within this army of God. Um, he says, who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? The same with a, with a farmer. I mean, when a farmer plants crops, I mean, he's going to eat some of the stuff that he grows. Or who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? <clears throat> so I think it's interesting that there's these three areas here. It sort of covers the three areas of, you know, the, the, the Christian war, right? In the sense that you've got the war that's going on, which is the spiritual fight between the powers of darkness and all that sort of thing. Then you've got the planting of the vineyard, which we would think about the sowing of the seed, right? The preaching of the gospel, going out there and, and sowing the word. And then the, the feeding of the flock is almost like that caretaking of, of the church, of God. He says, say I these things as a man, or saith not the Lord the same also? So he's saying this is not only just normal, normal wisdom of the world, right? But he's saying it's, it's also written in God's law in the sense, he says, for it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox, that treadeth out the corn. Right? So what is, it, what is it saying there? It's like when, when you muzzle the mouth of, of an animal, it's when you put that cover. Or you think about with dogs, where they muzzle the mouth of the dog so that the dog can't bite its own tail or can't attack other people. Right? So what they'd say here, they're saying you don't muzzle the mouth of the ox when he treads out the corn. So the ox is you know, he's in the yoke and he's treading out the corn. But if the, if the ox wants to stop and eat some of the corn, you let the ox eat some of the corn. You don't muzzle his mouth so that he can't eat while he's working. Um, so he's likening <coughs> the workers of the New Testament church to this, these oxen, that they, they work in, the, in, in God's vineyard and they should be able to support themselves and eat. 
Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plough in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sowed unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? So he's saying here, well, you know, if, if Paul is doing this work and investing spiritually into the Corinthian church, is it, is it such a great deal that he's able to forbear working and be supported by the Corinthian church? And he's saying, obviously not. Um, if others be partakers of this power of you, are not we rather? So we see here that there are other people being supported. And even, you know, in the Corinthian church, there were, there were false apostles that, that were abusing, you know, and, and being supported as well. And what Paul is saying here is, you know, if others are going, if you're going to support other people, of course, the, the apostles that, that started the Corinthian church and won them to Christ and, um, and did a lot for them, are they not even more worthy of being supported by them? He says, do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. So again, he's comparing even in the Old Testament, right? When we talked about tithes, we talked about the free will offerings, that that's how the, the, the Levites and the priests were supported. They lived off the giving uh, from God's people. Now, I don't think what he's saying here, like I said, I don't believe uh, tithes, are still continuing in the New Testament in the sense of the law to give to the Levitical priests. <coughs> He's just making a comparison here because a lot of people will say, ah, oh, you see here that the, the tithe is still happening because, you know, tithe was given to the Levites and then it's tithe is, and he's comparing the two. No, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of comparisons in the New Testament and the Old Testament that doesn't necessarily mean that the Old Testament practice is continuing into the New Testament. Right, so this is one of them, right? Where we have a New Testament practice, which is giving to the local church. But that doesn't mean tithing is still in place. The law of tithing is still in place in the New Testament. Just like we can see, I'll, I'll go one passage real quick. Um, uh, where we see here where uh, in Philippians 4, he says, but I have all and abound. I am full having received of Epaphroditus, the things which were sent from you, right? So we're not sure what was sent, right? You know, and generally when we see in the New Testament, well, money was changing hands, right? They were taking up collections and bringing them to Jerusalem, bringing them to different churches. But he says here, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. So you see how he's comparing the fact that we might give money to a local church, might give money to a missionary or, or to a minister. And he's comparing that to, to the burnt offerings in the Old Testament. Right, and saying just like they offered up sacrifices to God and it was a sacrifice acceptable, the odor of a sweet smell, you know, well-pleasing to God. That's the same in the New Testament. It's just making that comparison and saying, hey, one's giving to God. But it's not teaching here that, oh, well, you should still be offering up burnt offerings. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, it'd be the same. Oh, I won't go into that. So it, you get my point, right? He's just, he's just comparing the two. Um, it's not a support to say that, the, the, the law of tithing is, is still in effect. <coughs> it says, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So the, the principle is still there, though, that those doing the work of God full time are supported by God's people. Right? Like in the Old Testament, God's people supported the work of God. In the New Testament, it's the same. God's people support the work of God. It says here, but I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me, for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. Now, like I said, there are people out there that are very bitter, I don't know, or, you know, and I'm not saying necessarily that all of them have wrong intentions, like some of them do believe that they're just preaching the truth. But remember how we read further up, he says, you know, say I these things as a man, or saith not the law also? Because remember how he says here, who goeth a warfare at any time at his own charges? Who planteth the vineyard, eateth not of the fruit of the flock? Who fleet, feedeth the flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Because there's a lot of people out there trying to say that, you know, bishops shouldn't be able to take a wage. They should be working a job and all that sort of thing. There shouldn't be full-time workers in the New Testament church. And they, they kind of look to passages like this where he says, hey, see, Paul, you know, was this example, and they say, like, he did it. You know, he had this authority, but he was trying to set the example that he should work and things like that. Um, I want to show you that, you know, they're missing the context of what's happening in the Corinthian church where Paul is trying to distinguish himself from these false prof prophets. Because I can show you in the Bible where Paul did take from churches. So it's not that he was teaching that he just never took from churches, he never took a wage and things like that. But, you know, people that expect 
God's work and the local church to thrive and not have any full-time workers. You know, to, to me, even, even if the Bible didn't teach it, I sort of have this frame of mind like, like Paul saying, you know, say these things as a man, saying, isn't, isn't this just wisdom in the world? I mean, if you have a charity in the world, right, like just a worldly charity, and you want that charity to, to do well and to flourish, but you say, but that charity can't have any full-time workers. You know, political party as well. It's like, we want this political party to go really well, but we're not going to have any full-time politicians. You know, like we want this business to do really well, but we're not going to have any full-time workers. It's just like, it's just not, it's just not wise, just world, world-wise. You know, it's just, it's just not going to work. If you want an organization to do well, there needs to be people dedicated to that task. It's the same here. The people that don't want bishops and deacons to be paid and, and the church to not have full-time workers, they're, they're almost like saying like, well, let's build an army and have no full-time soldiers. You know, let's build, let's, let's, let's build like an agricultural industry, but we're not going to have any full-time farmers. You know, let's, let's, let's raise all this cattle and all this, this flock, but we're not going to have full-time shepherds. You know, everyone's just going to be part-time. Nobody's going to be dedicated to making sure things run smoothly, things like that. Um, it's just not reasonable. You know what I mean? And that's why if we want God's work to flourish, you know, that's why it, us as God's people, and I know it always sounds back as, you know, we as, and in this position, we have to teach on this, right? So it's kind of like, you know, isn't there a conflict of interest? But, you know, the Bible says what it says, you know, so you take it for what it is. And, you know, if, you know, it's like when, when you give to God, you know, you, you want to you give to something that you support, you know, like, don't, don't you want God's, don't you want this church to succeed? You know, if you want this church to, church to succeed, then we have to support and get behind it, not just with finances, but with your labor, you know, get be behind it and make it work. And if, you know, if people, you know, aren't 100% behind it, then I'm not saying that you have to give necessarily to this organization. You know, if you don't agree with everything that this church does, then find a work of God that you do agree with and, and give to that, you know, and, and help that to flourish, you know. So, you know, it doesn't bother me if people give to this church or they give to another church. You know, I'm not going to say that, you know, you need to, you know, uh, tithing and it's all about, you know, this is the church you're part of, so this is where you should be giving. But, it, it, you know, I, it, it's sort of like, well, you know, if this is the church you're part of, then don't you want this church to succeed? If you want the church to succeed, then, you know, we've got to get it going, right? But um, if... If for whatever reason, you know, because obviously this might just be the best church there is for you to go to, but then maybe there's a church somewhere or there's a, a, there's a, there's a work somewhere that you do support. You know, I'm just saying don't, don't use the fact that you're not in 100% agreement with this church to not give to God at all. Do you know what I mean? Like, don't use that excuse. That's all I'm saying. Like, you, you should be giving to God whether you give to this church or not. If, if this church is not what you want to fully get behind with your finances, then get behind something else and help that to flourish, you know, so that more people can be won to Christ because ultimately that's what's going to miss out if, um, you know, if you're, you know, keeping things just for yourself and not giving to the work of God. Um, so let me just get... <coughs> so there are people, you know, <laughs> sort of trying to make this point that there shouldn't be any full-time workers and they try and use Paul as an example to say, oh, you know, well, he didn't, he didn't use this power. I've used none of these things, neither have I written these things that it should be so done unto me. <coughs> and saying that there's this sort of glory in him just paying his own way, right? But that's not what, what, what happened with Paul. Because um, if you look here, if we just compare even within the Corinthian, and I'm, I'm mainly going to be focusing uh, in Corinthians. But if we go to 2 Corinthians 11, which is the second letter, <clears throat> we see here why, why did Paul deny himself of these things? Why did, like he, he says in these letters, that he abased himself, right? And that he, that he wasn't, didn't want to be chargeable to the Corinthians. And I believe it's because there were false apostles that he was trying to distinguish himself from. It's, he's not teaching that he never, ever took wages from a church and that he just always supported himself working a job. <laughs> Look at what it says here in 2 Corinthians 11. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted because I've preached to you the gospel of God freely? I just want to see. Uh, forget, there was, I don't know if I had it, if I go past this passage. But I might not get to it because it might be in a different part where he says, you know, um, he says, forgive me this wrong. 
So it's almost like Paul, you know, he acknowledged that he did this to distinguish himself, but yet he felt bad because he robbed the Corinthians of this blessing that they should have been able to, to support Paul as an apostle. So he goes, he, he goes, have I committed an offense in abasing, right, or humbling or denying himself from these things that ye might be exalted because I've preached to you the gospel of God freely? Look at this. I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. It's such an interesting passage there because, you know, this, this proves that Paul was supported by churches, right? So that's why it's not in 1 Corinthians 9 he's saying that he never was supported by churches. He always just worked. It's specific to the Corinthians. He's saying, I didn't take money from the Corinthians, right? But he says here in 2 Corinthians 11, in order to do the Corinthian service, he was robbing other churches, right? Taking wages of them. So the other churches were supporting him while he was trying to do service to the, the Corinthian church. So, but it's interesting that he uses the word, <laughs> I robbed other churches, which sort of like, it, it shows to me that, you know, that there, there is a responsibility of a local church to support the ministers that serve them, right? Because he's saying, because why? Because if he's robbing other churches, that means that the money that he was taking from those churches should have been going to the ministers looking after, you know, those churches. You know, if he, if he got it from Philippi, if he got it from Galatia. Right? So there's a responsibility if we're part of a local church to look after our church. And, and you know, it, it's like today, there's so much inefficiencies going on in the New Testament churches that we see today. Because you have churches that are, and you see it all the time, you're in a church and they have this minis, uh, missionary program, right? Where they're sending money all over the world, $20 here, $50 there. To all, but, but it's like, but, but it, they're, they're, their guy is, is not even supported. Like they don't even have, they don't even have much, like sometimes enough money to, to pay their workers. You know, their ministry is dying, but yet they're sending money all over the world. And every church is doing that. They're all sending money all over the place to all different people, paying all these transaction fees and different fees all over the place. When, you know, the churches, you know, they, sh they should really be like looking after their own first. You know, even the church that I used to be a part of, you know, we, we were receiving missionary money. We were also sending missionary money. I just, just didn't make sense at all. Like if, you're, if your preacher is receiving support from some American board somewhere, like you've got a responsibility there first to, to send money to that missionary instead of sending miss to, you know, missionaries in China and Japan all over the place. So it just, it just doesn't make sense. It says, I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. <coughs> for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. So you see here that it's not that he was just working always to supply, like people were still supporting him, you know, and they were bringing stuff to him from other churches. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Archaea. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. Right? So he's not saying that it's just so interesting when you read through this that it's almost like he's, he's like apologizing to the Corinthian church in not letting them give to him, right? Because it's like he's almost like denying them of that blessing, denying them, you know, he's saying, it's not that I wasn't denying it because, because I don't love you guys. I was denying it because of another reason. You know, God knows why I was doing it. So he wasn't boasting just to say, oh, look at me. I'm working my own way. What was he, what was he boasting about? He says, but what I do, that I will do, look at this, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. See, so he's saying here that there was a reason why, you know, he was denying himself from, on this money, because he was trying to distinguish himself from these false apostles. And maybe because the, the false apostles, they do want to get everyone's money, right? They're, they're trying to get all that. So maybe he's doing that knowing that they were false apostles, and now he's like forcing them to live like him, sort of like say, you know, if you really are serving God, then, you know, then do as I do. Um, and, and he's sort of calling them out on that. Because look, and then he says here, for, because for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. No marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So this I can see, if you read through this, you can see that this is, this is the reason why. There was a controversy going on in the Corinthian church. There were false apostles creeping in and, and Paul he was doing something about it, right? And, 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 uh, and trying to expose these guys um, for the false apostles that they were. <coughs> now, even if, 
in 1 Corinthians 9. So in 1 Corinthians 9, we sort of learn that God's people support God's work. But then some people will try and make the case and say, well, <clears throat> yeah, you know, they were, they were taking collections in the New Testament church, but it was just if you were an apostle, right? Or somebody was traveling, not for bishops and deacons in the local church that don't travel and, and things like that. But you don't need to go to just 1 Corinthians 9 to support this idea that um, you know, bishops in the local church should be supported by God's people. Uh, we go to 1 Timothy 5 for that. So in 1 Timothy 5, I'll just start in verse 3. <coughs> this is where we see here, it says, Honour widows that are widows indeed. And the reason why I'm starting here is because I just want to show you that when the Bible talks about honour, it's not only respect, like it can be respect as well, but honour here as well is, is it's like a euphemism to actually to, to provide for people. So when it's saying honour widows that are widows indeed, and it says, and if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. So this is about supplying for widows, right? So when, when, when the church is looking after widows, it's not just giving them respect. It's like a widow comes and she has need and you're just like, you just respect her, right? And it's like, she's not getting enough respect at church, so you better go home and get respect. But don't, don't give her anything, right? Because it's, 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 not, it's not actually physical, physical material things to, to supply their, their needs. They're just at home just to be respected. No, of course not. No, the, the passage is talking about supplying for widows. That's what the honour is talking about. And then it goes into, uh, you know, what, which... <clears throat> widows should be taken care, taken care of and providing for your own house and if you don't you're worse than an infidel and the widows having to be you know good works and over 60 years old if they're going to be taken on full time by the church <coughs> <coughs> and younger widows should marry now I just want to uh, jump down to verse 17 so verse 17 is where it gets into the elders now so the elders and uh, the bishops, right? Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honour, right? So it's not just saying to respect them double the amount of a, of a widow. No, it's saying that they, they ought to be getting paid double, right, what widows get paid, right? It says, especially they who labour in the word and doctrine, right? So there are elders that particularly labour in teaching the word, right? And those especially should be getting double honour. And look at this, for the scripture saith, and then look, this is familiar, isn't it? Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labourer is worthy of his re reward. Now, if you remember, we read that in 1 Corinthians 9, didn't we? So when he talks about here, God's people um, supporting, to say are these things as a man or saith not the law, same also for it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. See, so it's not just that just because Paul was an apostle, he had the authority to take wages from the church. No, it's, it's also for the bishops and deacons in the New Testament. <clears throat> um, I want to show you as well, uh, if we just compare this quickly to Luke 10, we see here that uh, <clears throat> the laborer is worthy of his reward. That's a quote actually from Luke where Jesus says here, and in the same house remain eating and drinking such things as they give. So this is when people were supernaturally providing for the apostles as they would go uh, house to house and preach the gospel. Uh, for the laborer is worthy of his hire, right? Go not from house to house. So they, would, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't eat from house to house, right? They'd stay at one house, but they'd be preaching the gospel from house to house. Uh, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. So we see here that a reward, because some people will say like, well, having respect is like a reward. Well, you know, well, if we compare scripture with scripture, we see here that it's a higher, right? There is actually uh, money changing hands in order to s support these people. <clears throat> Last passage I want to show you on this topic is Matthew 15. <coughs> <coughs> Where we see here the command to honour thy father and mother. It says, for God commanded, saying, honour thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honour not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. So this is where Jesus is rebuking uh, people, saying that, you know, you, the, the Bible says to honour your father or mother, but people were saying, you know, well, when, I, when I give things to my mom and dad, 
like this is a gift, this is something that, that is on top of what is expected of you. But he's saying, no, 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 it's not, it's not a gift. You, you're not honouring your mother and your father when you don't provide for them when they need that help, right? Because we have an obligation um, to take care of our parents. You know, when our parents cannot take care of themselves anymore, children have an obligation to take care of their parents. And this is part of the honouring, right? So the part of the honouring is not just respecting your parents, but actually providing for them as well when they are no longer able to provide for themselves. So, you know, if you, if you, you know, have siblings, right, and, you know, you're the only Christian in, in amongst your siblings and your parents can no longer take care of themselves, God expects you to take up, take up that position, right, you know, and, take, and say that and invite your parents into your home to take care of them when they can no longer take care of themselves. <coughs> um, okay, so we see here that's, that's one of the major reasons, right, that we give to the local church. We're trying to get it to flourish. It needs full-time workers. Um, and a lot of people are out there, and I, you know, I understand, you know, I understand that people, you know, like I said, you know, they've had bad experiences, there's a lot of scams out there, there's a lot of people not spending God's money wisely, there's a lot of people taking a wage and not doing the work, right? They're, they're not doing the work, and people get frustrated, but that doesn't mean <coughs> that it isn't the right model, you know, it's, it's like with the model of there being church leadership, and people are frustrated with church leaders abusing their power and, and making bad decisions, all that sort of stuff. So then they want more of a democratic system of church as opposed to, you know, where we have bishops and deacons, a top-down sort of ordination. Now, we don't change God's system just because people are abusing the authority that they have. You know, they will be accountable to God. We just have the responsibility to follow as closely as possible to what God has laid out in <coughs> the Scriptures. All right, let's go to a couple other passages real quick as well. 1 Corinthians 16. <coughs> There's some more principles here. It says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, so not only to pay for the full-time workers of church, but also to, to help other people, right? So when a church gets to a point where they, can, they are flourishing, right, and there is a lot of finance, that's when the church can do other things, right? Take on other tasks or help other churches that need help, that aren't to the point yet. Um, so I'm not against, like I said, I'm not against... Uh, church is sending money here or there, or obviously, so I'm not saying that they shouldn't do that. I'm just saying it doesn't make sense if the money is needed at home, that there, all this money to go overseas and in different transaction fees, if the money is needed at home, where the local church there is not even flourishing yet. And it did always frustrate me, like, you know, like people should be giving to their church in order to make it flourish, because I, I, I knew churches, like you see churches in third world countries, like in Mexico and whatnot, and they have congregations that are bigger than churches in America or Australia that are supporting them, right? So, so, so a church in Australia that has a congregation of like 40 people is sending money to some church in the Philippines or some church in Mexico or some church in India that has like hundreds of people, but yet they, they, can't, they can't support their, their bishop over there and, and they need to take funds from, uh, from, from a church overseas. It just it doesn't make sense at all. Now concerning the collection for the saints, if I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. <coughs> so this is why, in the local church, this is why we take up a collection every week. This is why every week you come, you, know, you put your money in the box, and, and there's collections every week. This is the pattern we see in uh, the New Testament, where Paul not only gave this to the Corinthian church, but he says even in the churches of Galatia, he said, you know, when they get together on the first day of the week, that that's when they should be taking up that collection. And, and, and so there should be this consistent giving from the people of God, right? So it's not that, you know, just whenever you feel like it, every now and then you just dump, you know, some money in there. It should be something that's always at the forefront, right? Because we're always making money every week and should be something that we're giving every week. So that's why you sort of think like, well, what's the difference in that tithing? Well, that's what I'm saying. There's no real practical difference. That's why I'm just trying to set the doctrine right so that you know that we give to the local church for these reasons given in the New Testament, not because the Levitical priesthood is somehow still applicable in the New Testament. <clears throat> so we see here this regular, consistent giving each week. Now let's go to one last passage here. 2 Corinthians 9, <clears throat> where we see again Paul talking about churches giving, right, and, 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 and giving to the work of God. 
Since it's for us touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Archaea was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Right, so it's interesting that he's, he's basically saying here that <laughs> like he knows the zeal of the Corinthian church and he's, and he's been telling everybody, like, you know, this is how zealous this church is. You know, when he's on his travels, he's like, hey, the Corinthian church, you know, they're on fire for God. Um, but uh, what he's saying here is, is because when, when he comes to, to collect their offering, he doesn't want to go there and find them unprepared, right? I mean, he's saying, he's, he's talked about how, how zealous they are and how, how generous they are. And then he gets to the Corinthian church and it's like, they've got nothing to give. It's a, bit, it's a little bit shameful, right? So it's interesting. He's sort of sending it forward saying, hey, we're coming. I want you to be ready. <clears throat> Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, ye may be ready. <coughs> yes, less happily if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared. We, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Right? So it's like Paul is like, and, and, and what I get from this is that, that, our, that our zeal should line up with our giving, right? Like if, if, we, if we are really zealous about something and we really want to make it to work, like giving is a no-brainer, right? Like if, it's like people in political parties, they really want that to work. If they really want that to succeed, they're willing to put money into it in order to make it grow and to help it to flourish. So here, what I sort of get from this, it, it's kind of, it's the, the financial, uh, what's the word, position of a church, it, it's, it's, it's almost a reflection of the church's zeal. Right now, obviously, if a church is small, you know, you're not expecting it to be like some huge mega church. But some churches have really, really large congregations, right? They have really, really large congregations. They have no reason why they shouldn't be able to pay the bills, have full-time workers, and yet they're still struggling for money. To me, it's, it's, it's a bit shameful in the sense that it, it shows that this church is not that zealous to, to, to get that church to succeed. And, you know, we see it from God's point of view. It's, it's a bit shameful in the sense that, well, you've got so all these people that are supposedly zealous, they're actually not that zealous. Because if they were, then, then the church would have no problem. And churches that are zealous, they don't have any problems, right? Like, we haven't had any problems. Um, you know, churches that, that are zealous for, for, for the work of God, there's always enough, right? Because it, it's, it's just not, not, a, not an issue. <coughs> And churches that are zealous generally have smaller congregations and yet accomplish much more than churches that are only zealous on the outside and yet you know, are, are not um, willing to give to the work. So he says, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof you had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. So it's interesting that he's, he's sort of boasting about them, but seems like he doesn't trust them enough to, 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 to actually do it. He's still giving them the heads up. It's like, it's like when he was writing to Philemon and he's saying, like, he knows Philemon's going to do it, but he's still telling Philemon, you know, to, to, to do things if you, if you read the letter of Philemon. <clears throat> he says, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So this is where I see these two passages here. Um, where we should really have our mindset when we think about what should be the attitude when we give in the New Testament. Every man... Uh, where did I just jump to? 15. I just jumped to 1 Corinthians 16. Sorry. <coughs> Verse 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Now, there's so much in these two passages. Um, we'll just go through it really quickly. But he says here, But this I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So this is the mindset in the New Testament. It's not how much do I need to give to God? I need to work out exactly what is 10% because that's what it's expected of me from God. No, the, the mindset is how much do you want to reap you know, how much are you going to sow and how much are you going to reap? Now, this is not a materialistic reaping, right? This is not the whole prosperity preacher, like you give $10, God's going to put $1,000 in your bank account, all that sort of stuff, right? This is saying the more we put into God's work, like I said 
I can't remember what I said, but you know, when you give to God, you can only really give money or time, right? And time is money because money is really a measure of your time, right? The time that you put in, right? So, so there's no difference really between money and time. This is how we give to God. We either give our time or we give our money, which is time spent making money, right? So he's saying here, the more you invest into God's kingdom, the more you're going to reap spiritually right in terms of the more that work is going to flourish the more treasure you're going to be laying up in heaven and we see that in this passage so it's not teaching here that you give to god you're going to be paid back materialistically it's just saying here hey the more you sow to the kingdom of god the more god's kingdom is going to reap and you're going to reap a part of that right it says every man according as he purposeth in it purposeth in his heart so let him give so we see here that if the giving was just a set amount, you know, why is it according to as you purpose in your heart? So you decide the amount. You decide how much you want to invest, how much you are going to give to the kingdom of God because you can ultimately decide how you're going to spend your talents. Right? How are you going to spend your talents? How are you going to spend your resources? But you know, the more you sow into the kingdom of God, the more you're going to reap. So let it get, not grudgingly or of necessity. See, so it's not, it's, it's your money. See, remember with the tithe, that's God's money, right? Now, ultimately, everything belongs to God. We ought to be living for God. But you, you are a steward, right? You're given money. The question is, how are you going to spend it? You know, so this is more the choices in your hand. It's not of necessity for you to give, but God loves a cheerful giver. So it's cheerful giving rather than grudging giving, you know, that you have to. It's, you know, how, how much a part of this work do you want to be and you want to see it flourish and God is able to make all grace abound towards you that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. So God, you know, I think God does promise to provide us with our needs. You know, like seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. So I don't think God is going to let his people, you know, unless they're slack and lazy and not working, right? But people that are, you know, trying to walk in the spirit, they're always going to have their needs fulfilled. But that doesn't mean necessarily you're going to be filthy rich, you know. It says, as it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now here's where I think we can see that the, 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 the sowing and the reaping, is, it's spiritual, right? It's not this physical, you give more, you're going to make more money. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So the so to me, that's hearkening back to the fact that we are supporting the work of God. By doing that, we're supporting the workers of God, right? Those that are doing that full time. And when we, when we do that, when we, when we actually have people that are full time, that, you know, are not waiting tables like in, we see in Acts, you know, it's not reason that we should leave the uh, word of God and serve tables. That's what happens when we, when people try to, pr to promote this idea that the, we, that the church shouldn't have full time workers. Because if it has full-time workers, then they can focus on the task at hand, which is increasing the seed that is sown, right? And, and increasing the fruits of your righteousness. So this is where if there are people working full-time, those are the people that are helping the church grow and helping to disciple more people, right? So we can get more people saved and more people, um, you know, into the kingdom of God. Now we see here that the people that do give financially, they do take a part in that. Because we see here that people that gave to Paul financially, he even said that the fruit that he wanted to Christ, the people that he wanted to Christ, people had a part in that, the people that supported him. Philippians 4, he says, Now ye Philippians, know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. So not only was it churches from Macedonia, Right, he got ch money from Galatia. Uh, Corinthian church probably ended up also supporting him as well, but also here the Philippian church sent. <clears throat> For even in Thessalonica, he sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift. Look at this, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. For I have all and abound. I am full. I mean, we've already read that, right? Having received of paradise things which were sent from you. So you see here, I just wanted to point out verse seventeen. He's saying here. You know, God is going to supply his needs, right? Paul wasn't worried that he was, he was uh, you know, he was going to have his needs met. But he was, he was saying here that the reason why that he wanted the Philippian church and he liked them giving to God because he desired fruit that may abound to their account. Because 
when they invested in his work, right, the thing he was doing, then the people that he affected to the kingdom of God, they had a part to play in that. And that's why when we give to the work of God, that's really our mindset, is how much of an effect do, do, do I want to have in the kingdom of God if I am not somebody who is working full time in a local church, that's one way I can really have a, a huge part in the effectiveness of a work. So all that to say this, you know, let's just finish on one last verse. Because, <clears throat> you know, I, I preached on tithing last week and, you know, maybe after you hear this sermon, you're like, well, what's really the difference? Well, th that's why there, there, there isn't much difference in terms of practicality. What, what the difference is, is in the doctrine, is in why do we give to the local church? We're not giving to the local church because tithing is required of us and the, and the local church is the new Levitical priesthood and tithing is still in effect. No, it's if we want the church of God to flourish and we want to reap bountifully, then we need to sow bountifully and have people supported in the local church so that it will increase our fruit and increase the amount of seed sown. Um, so, the, so the difference is just the doctrine is sound, but the attitude is different as well. And how I'd like you to think of it is, you know, when, when you think about tithing, and I sort of mentioned it at the beginning, the focus is really on the amount that you give to God, right? They're, everyone's trying to work out what is 10%, but that's not the attitude that we should have in the New Testament. We should be trying to give as much as possible to God's work, whether it's our time or our resources, because that's ultimately what we are here to do. Yeah, not everybody, you know, uh, qualifies to be full time in the ministry, but that doesn't mean your life isn't about God's work. You know, the reason why we go out and we make money is so that we can further God's kingdom. You know, does that mean that, you know, we can't make wise investments, we can't start businesses and do this and make more money? No, but ultimately, why should we be increasing our wealth? We're increasing our wealth so that we can sow more to the kingdom of God. So to me, it's the attitude is different. It's not about the worth, right, in terms of how much to give to God, which is the focus of tithing, right, because it's working out what a tenth of your income is, post-tax, pre-tax, do I tithe on gifts, do I tithe on... Somebody had me over for dinner. I wonder how much they spend on that dinner because now I've got to tithe on it. So you see how it's just like, it, it's a different mentality. The mentality is not you working out this amount. The mentality is, you know, let's make God's work flourish. So it's not about the worth right? Of how much you give. It's about the work. Um, and when I think about that, I, th I think about this passage here, you know, in Luke 11, you know, with this, the Pharisees, they, they're getting all caught up in just working out the tithe of these little amounts. It's, but woe unto you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs. So you remember they had to give the tenth unto the Levites? So he's saying here, yeah, imagine they're, they're tithing mint I don't, I don't, I'm not sure what rue is, right? And all, all these herbs, right? So it's like, it's like they, they get like this harvest of like, you know, mustard seeds, right? And they're counting out, like, make sure I give a tenth to Levites. But he says, but you pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. So tithing, the focus is that 10%, right? Giving to the Levites, whereas the focus in the New Testament should be the love of God, you know, the work of God, right? Helping that to flourish. And honestly, if somebody is, 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 is zealous for God and, and, and cares about the work of God, they will probably end up giving more than 10%. Because a lot of people will say, oh, you know, are you just against tithing because you're stingy and you don't want to give 10%. But the funny thing is the people that, that aren't for tithing, they probably give more than 10% to God. You know, they give more, more because they, cause the, the mindset is, well, because I want to, to, to sow and I want to reap bountifully and I want God's works to be supported and I want God's work to flourish. They end up giving over and above, and they, they would gladly, gladly do that. All right, so I hope you learned something there, um, just covering those topics. Let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, uh, for your word, and um, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to have a heart uh, that would give. And uh, Lord, we know that um, you know we can give of our time, we can give of our money. Um, Lord, I just, I just pray, whether it's our time or our money that we give, that Lord, we just uh, remember that. The true reason we're here is to, you know, um, to further your kingdom, to preach the gospel, to baptize believers, to, to make disciples. And I pray, Lord, that as we live in this world, that, Lord, we will not lose that focus, that we would excel in our jobs, in our business, in, in our careers, 
um, Lord, that we would make wise investment decisions, not just so, Lord, that we can have a lavish and, and, and lascivious lifestyle, but no, Lord, that, that we can further your kingdom, that we can do greater works and, and, and support those that are uh, doing the ministry full time, Lord, and that we would increase the seed and increase the fruit. So uh, thank you, Lord, um, for upping the standard in the New Testament. And uh, I pray, Lord, that you would give us grace to, to be able to apply it to our lives. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.